Welcome to Living Free Today, a ministry of Cornerstone Fellowship in San Lorenzo, California. These podcasts are the weekly sermons of Dr. Michael L. Wilson. If you would open your Bibles, please, to Psalm number 44. Psalm 44 is the next one that is written by the sons of Korah. Sons of Korah was a family-sponsored, if you will, worship band, worship team that worked in the tabernacle in the temple. Uh, the, the name comes from people that were saved from destruction back in the book of Exodus and Numbers. And what they have done is they have written six or seven psalms that were used in temple worship, that were used as instruction. The title says a maskil. Maskil is an ancient Hebrew word that means to instruct or to tell. So the point is that they were supposed to sing this psalm, and in doing so, it was to be educational. It was to show them things about how to act or how to believe We do not know the individual names of the people who were sons of Korah at this time, and we do not know when this was written. People have looked at it and tried to guess. It does talk about uh, being sold out to the nations, and so maybe they're thinking that it was when the Assyrians or the Babylonians came against Israel, or people have even said that it happened during the Roman advancement during the intertestamental period, but there's no way to know. All those are guesses. And so we see it as just the inspired Word of God, and we look at it to determine how we can believe and what we can do. It starts out with God's deeds in the past. It says, O God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in the days, in the days of old. And what they're talking about is God's greatness, because he says, For not my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. So there were events in the past, this psalm says, where God was able to bring victory to the Jewish people, without them lifting a sword, without them raising an army. And, of course, the first time that happened would have to be in the book of Exodus, where the Jewish people were enslaved, and they did not have a slave revolt. God did not give them all swords and tell them to stand up against the Egyptians. God sent Moses and ten plagues, and without the Jewish people raising a finger of resistance... The Egyptians expelled them with great force. The Egyptians forced them to leave and, in fact, gave them great wealth as they were leaving. And so God beat the Egyptians on behalf of the Jewish people without raising a sword, without building an army. And then they go through the wilderness, and then as they enter the promised land, Joshua is now in charge, and Joshua comes up against the town of Jericho. And you all know the story of Joshua fitting the battle of Jericho. What happened? The walls came a-tumbling down. So their only weapons in the battle of Jericho was torches and trumpets. They walked around it once, went home, went to bed. Next day, walked around it for seven days. On the seventh day, they walked around it seven times. They blew the trumpets And the walls fell down flat. Not a cannon was used. Not an army was used. God gave that city to the Jewish people without raising a sword. And so what this psalm is saying and what these sons of Korah are remembering is that God can do these amazing things. God can rescue them and save them without them raising a finger. All they have to do is believe be part of the covenant, and God will come and rescue. And he has done this time and time again in the past as Joshua moved through the promised land. And you can read that in the book of Joshua. It says in every city that he came to that God gave them over into their hands, that they were uh, given over to destruction. 
that even when an army was involved and even when Joshua's people had swords and bows and arrows, their view of what was happening, of what was written in, in theistic history, is that their army was a minor player. All they had to do was show up and God was going to give this city, these people, into their hands. God was going to defeat them without Joshua breaking a sweat, basically. Yes, he had to show up. Yes, they had weapons. But the fight was God's. And it was that way throughout the promised land. God had promised to give the Canaanite land to the Jewish people. And the first campaign of Joshua going south and then north was to clean out that great plain that later became Jerusalem and Israel. And so they know this. It says, uh, the deed you performed in the days of our fathers. Our fathers have told us. And how did their fathers tell us? Well, even in this time, even if this was written around the time of David, David had the scrolls of the Old Testament that were written. The Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. He had at least that set. First and Second Kings were being written. First and Second Chronicles were being written in the time of David. First and Second Samuel was being written in the time of David. But all the books before that, he had them in scrolls and he could read them and he could have them read to him. Same with the sons of Korah as these were lore of the Jewish people about how God had knocked out the enemies and that God had made the Jews the chosen people and they would always survive. And this is the mindset of these people. This is the mindset of these people writing this song. It says, in God, in verse 8, in God we have boasted continually and will give thanks to your name forever. And then it says, Selah. Selah is a pause. It is a breathing pause. And if you look at the difference between 8 and 9, there is a chance to pause. We have just been told that God is this great protector of Israel, that God is this great uh, keeper of Israel, that, that the things that are happening are not because of our might, but because God has chosen us. Then it says in verse 9, after we've paused and, and pondered that, but you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. And so it changes and this brings about the confusion or the conflict of this psalm is that it starts by saying, God, you are great. You do all these great things. We have a history with you. And the view of the Jewish people is if God acted this way in the past, he will act this way in the present and this way in the future. That God is consistent. God is unchanging. Therefore, if God did something in the past, it will be repeated such that we can count on it. And so their understanding of what they're saying is there was some military conflict and the enemy came in or they went to the enemy and they lost. And they look at the past about how Joshua and Moses and those people succeeded and it creates a cognitive dissonance. They can't hold these two thoughts in their head at the same time. It brings about a confusion. Either God is this or God is not this. And our present stand, our present conflict, our present loss would say God is not that. They're actually concerned that God has changed or that God has lied in some way. So their first thing they do is they say, uh, but you have rejected us and disgraced us. You made us turn back. You have sold your people. They, they actually look at themselves and they say, so in verse 20, 19, 20, 21, what they're saying is, if I had broken the covenant, God would certainly know it. And they look in the past at when the covenant was broken, as when there was problems in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve broke the covenant. They know that story. God let them know immediately, and there was consequences, 
immediately. So if they had broken the covenant, their logic is, and, and people carry this logic today, that God knows it and he would let me know. God would correct me at the moment I broke the covenant. God would correct me at the time I sinned against him. And David, in several of the other earlier psalms, when he is sick and when he is suffering, is able to say, this is because of my sin. This is because I have broken a covenant with you. And this is the reasoning that they're going through, that if God is this way in the past and he's not this way in the future, and it's because of something I've done, there should be an in-between thing of God telling me. God is not a trickster. God does not set us up. God does not, in the Bible, except for books like Ezekiel and Revelation, God is not vague. God says what he says, and he means what he means. And they know this, and that's why they're saying, if we sinned, if we messed up, then God should have told us. God should have brought us to this and so he could correct us instead of letting us go against this army, against these people, against the Assyrians or the Philistines or whatever, and losing, and losing terribly. And so there is a confusion as to what God is going to tell us and what God is doing now. And this idea of looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, I'm loyal, I'm righteous, my sins are all forgiven, I've confessed everything I know, I can't think of a single thing that is against God in my life, and yet, I still have bad days, and yet there are still tragedies. I'm sick, I have financial problems, my car breaks down, I have a flat tire. One thing we have to realize is that these things that happen to you are never, can never, and will never be punishment for your sin. If you are a Christian, nothing bad that happens to you is seen by God as punishment for your sin. You will never, can never, will never, ever, ever, ever be punished for your sin if you are a Christian because all of your sin was nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ and he was punished for your sin. If you are also punished for your sin, then we would say Jesus was incomplete. Jesus is weak. Jesus' thing didn't work. Somehow the, the cross system was broken. And so when bad things happen, never, ever, 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 ever think that is punishment for your sin. If you, get a, if you forget to put your offering in the offering plate and you get a flat tire, and I've heard people say this, God does not give you a flat tire because you forgot to put offering in the offering plate. I have heard people say, God is going to get my money one way or the other, either through a car repair or the offering. That is blasphemy. That is heresy. You get flat tires because imperfect human invented tires and we can't... They don't put street sweepers every five minutes on the freeways to get all the nails off. That's why you have flat tires, because it's a broken world. But this idea... This idea of God saying something, and, and, and we see this in the Bible. We can, we can look at the cross. We can look at the promises of Scripture about how God loves us and he's going to protect us. And we see Jesus healing people. And then I break my leg, and it's kind of like I, the two don't go together. And a lot of people leave the church. A lot of people say God's confusing or God must not exist, and their Christianity falls apart because they can't handle tragedy while in the Christian life. There's a book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Harold S. Kushner was a rabbi, and he wrote this book because his daughter died. And he said, if God loves me, my daughter would not have died, is his logic. 
and he presented the question, either God is not love, either God has mood swings, and in his bad moods he kills us, is his view, or God is pure love and loves us, but he's weak, and he's unable to save us physically. And his conclusion in the book is that God is weak and unable to save us physically, which is a, is a rough position to be in. I would never uh, call God weak to his face. Um, he has other reasons. And as a response, R.C. Sproul, who has gone to be with the Lord, said, wrote a book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? This Only Happened Once, and he volunteered. The only bad thing that happened to a good person was the cross. Jesus is the only good person. Even though we're saved, we are still, in our heart of hearts, wicked. And that doesn't get fixed until you get glorified. The Holy Spirit is working on you. We, we sing about transforming my mind and conforming my will. Uh, be holy, we sing. And that is what the Holy Spirit is doing, little by little. And at the end, it will be uh, instant when you are glorified and your sin nature is finally removed. But between now and then... Most of the bad things that happen is caused by ourselves because we make bad decisions. But Paul answered this. So we looked at the New Testament. We don't have to get hung up in the Old Testament and say, what did this guy think? Because Paul actually answered this question. And he answers this question in Romans 8. The, Romans 8, if you, if you need a pick-me-up of God's on your side then you read Romans 8, because that is the chapter, that's what it's all about. God is on your side, and you are on His, and everything's going to turn out okay. And when you get near the end, starting around 31, it says, What shall then we say, these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And you say, wow, that's really neat. I'm going to win. No, nobody can bring anything against me. Then he continues, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us. And then, Paul quotes Psalm 44, 22, and says, Oh, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? It's all really good. Then he quotes Psalm 44, as is it written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So you have this great statement, both positive and negative, from two points of view of nothing can separate us on earth from the love of God, and nothing can cause God to stop loving us. And right in the middle of it, he quotes Psalm 44, 22, which says, Yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. And I think as God was giving Paul Romans 8, and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he was writing this, Paul knew his Old Testament. Paul may have memorized most of the Old Testament. Paul knew Psalm 44 like the back of his hand. He knew, knew the difficulties that it brought up in Old Testament theology, Paul was a Hebrew and Bible scholar. He knew more about the Bible than we ever will. I hope he will hold classes in heaven when we get there explaining all these things. And right in the middle of you can't be touched, nothing, you're always going to win, always going to win, always going to win, always going to win. He says, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. So even in the New Testament, we have this fantastic standing with God, but life still hurts. We have this wonderful love coming from God, 
but things still break. Children still die. We still get colds. And what he's saying is, this world in its broken, sinful, debauched state is not a reflection of your relationship with God or God's relationship with you. That this world is over here, and even though it hurts, and even though there's problems, and even though there's difficulties and challenges and traumas, all these statements about God's love are still true. That even though you are hurting, you are still more than a conqueror through him who loved us. The word more than a conqueror literally means super conqueror. You can wear a big C on your chest. For super conqueror, we are unbeatable conquerors, is what Paul is saying. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But you're still going to break bones. You're still going to get flat tires. You're still going to go bankrupt. You're still going to have things fail. You're still going to make wrong decisions. But that has nothing to do with your relationship with God. The only thing it has to do with the relationship, it has to do with God, is how you deal with it. If you can go through a challenge, a difficulty, and say, I am more than a conqueror because of God's love for me, waiting in the hospital waiting room, you can be more than a conqueror because of God's love for you, and whatever is going on in that hospital does not cripple God does not stand between his love and you. This list that Paul gives is all-inclusive. No death or life, no angels or rulers, things present or things to come, or powers, or height or depth. And then if he didn't cover it, he says, nor anything else in all creation. So if it's been created, and everything but God has been created, if it's been created... It cannot get between you and God's love. It cannot, cannot, cannot alter your salvation. No matter what trauma you're going through, challenge, problem, uh, you look at the wildfires, you look at the political situation, you look at the gun violence, none of that gets between you and and God and his love for you. It cannot. And so the question, and if you look at 44, it's really anticlimactic. It ends with, rise up, come to our help, redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. And there's no resolution in Psalm 44, but there's a resolution on the cross. Jesus Christ said, yeah, life is this way, but I've fixed it. i fixed the meaning behind it. i fixed something that rises over it, that the difficulties of life do nothing to change, weaken, disrupt God's love for you. And so this is a, this is a worldview. This is a, a belief system If you want to know how do you apply this, it means next time you're doing something and it hurts, you thank God for sending Jesus Christ to the cross and him taking the bigger hurt of all my sin. You can always thank God for what he's doing, no matter what you're going through. You can always thank God for who he is, no matter what your situation is. You can be in a POW camp and you can still praise God for who he is and what he's done. Because the things of the world are because, literally, Satan owns the world and it's broken with sin. And we are living in enemy territory. 
And so we can expect it to hurt. We can expect things to happen, and our response is not, wake up, God. Our response is not, rescue me every time I ask God. Our response is, yes, this hurts, but it doesn't separate me from the love of God. God's love is supreme, is eternal, and overshadows everything we go through. If you are a Christian, all of the things that matter with sin have been put on the cross, but you're still affected by sin, the world is still built on sin, and you're going to be face to face and bump up against sin all the time, but that in no way affects your God's love for you. Nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of God. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, teach us to understand that things that we go through, the pain that we go through, does not catch you by surprise, does not cause you to wring your hands and wonder what to do, that you are always awake, you are always with us, and being with us, I pray that you would give us the strength to go through these situations, to go through these events, and give you glory on the other side. Not glory for the hurt, but glory because you sent your Son to die for us, and nothing on earth can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We thank you for this, Lord, and we pray your blessing on the remainder of the day. We ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen. Cornerstone Fellowship is located at 180 Llewellyn Boulevard, San Lorenzo, California. Our Sunday morning service is at 1045 a.m. Our website is livingfreetoday.org and our phone number is 510-278-2622. May God continue to bless you as you serve your King. God bless.